Semmi, 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 Another chance. So it's Adar, right? It's so great we had to do it twice this year. Um, today, you know, it's an interesting thing when Dave asked me to do this. First of all, this is such a huge honor to be able to uh, to be here for this. I I remember sitting in the base medrash when we were supposed to be learning, and um, <laughs> and uh, Dave coming up with the idea, and I was like, that's crazy, right? That's nutty. And uh, here we are, six and a half years later. And it's a book. It's like real. And to bring something into the world. One of my heroes, one of my great rebellion that I've had in my life, Steve Jobs, you know, he said uh, his thing was real artists ship. It's not real until it ships. And where, Dave, where are you? Better. Oh, you shipped. So that's great. So it's an honor to be here. And um, it's Adar. And I want to share a story that like a lot of people in this room were actually a part of. And uh, it really starts eight years ago today. Right? Today's Rosh Chodesh Adar. And um, like Purim, I never got Purim. Like all the other holidays make a lot of sense. And I used to run programs, and I still do run programs. I never ran a program on Purim because it was just too real. You could run, you know, a Pesach Seder for a bunch of people. You could run, you could even do like a Yom Kippur service for people who have never been involved, in, and, and that works. But Purim is just too deep. And I always wondered about that. What, you know? Maybe it's because, like, Simcha is so deep. But I never got it until eight years ago. Eight years ago, my, uh, my mother had just made Aliyah. And she had this weird heart disease thing that happened. Just really quickly. The whole thing happened really fast. She went to the hospital, had heart surgery, came out. The operation was a success. I had a newborn baby at home. Felt really good. It's Rosh Chodesh Adar. Right around the corner from here, we went to Korina in the morning. And that was when like the whole Hevra, I guess the whole Hevra just kind of still lives here. I, I used to live here. And um, we went down, and we were down, and we davened. And there was so much joy, so much real outpouring of happiness. And you know, start the morning singing, Misha, 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 Misha. Me, Misha. All right, go Gilly. <laughs> So, it's great. I left there. I felt so good. Now, things turn around. I get a call that afternoon. My mom had died. Like, just out of the blue. Like, not out of the blue. She, the operation was success. She went back. And just, like, spun my world. Right? And the hardest part about being in mourning is like, when you're doing it during Adar, just had Rosh Chodesh Adar, and that night I'm at my mom's grave on, on Har Menuchot, and what's playing in my head is this Misha, 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 Misha. I'm like, wow. Like, how do you be Basimcha? Like, is it even, you know, is it possible? What's that all about? And as tough as that is, that tune, how many times do you hear that around Jerusalem during Adar? And it has a whole different ring and a whole different cadence when you're in that situation. Then comes Purim. You're in Shloshi. You're in mourning. How do you deal with Purim? And this is where, like, Halacha really, you know, what's amazing about, you know, Hilchos Avelos is, it's really just Minhagim. Right? There's not so. Do you, do you think if there's ever a time where you're supposed to have something that you could grab onto? It's almost as if our sages were saying, there's nothing to grab onto here. So we decided we're not going to do like, obviously, you can't go to a big Suda. You can't party. So we're going to have a small thing at my stepfather's house. And the family gets together. And you can imagine what, you know, we're sitting there in costumes. We dressed up in costumes anyway. But we're in mourning. And uh, my stepfather goes to the freezer. And this is the most Purim Decha thing I've ever experienced. He pulls out a frozen soup 
from the freezer. My mom had made it before she had gone into the hospital. So the last time eating my mom's cooking in this world is on Purim. I've never enjoyed a soup more. Now one of them, it's felt about Purim. And one of the crazy things is when you're in a situation like that, do you get drunk? Like I knew, I'm staring at this bottle of wine. I'm like, this is good, gonna go one of two ways. <laughs> Either I'm going to end up curled up in a fetal position, uh, just an emotional mess, or I'm going to have a life-changing experience. Guess what I decided? L'chaim. <laughs> I started drinking and drinking and drinking. And then, of course, you know, pour them. Torah comes out. And I'm like, there's this beautiful Torah from Reb Shlomo where he says, you know, he quotes Rebbe Nachman, that a Jew has to have holy chutzpah. It's chutzpah dick to pray, right? To say, God, I need this. And I said, you know, something like, I have holy chutzpah. We're in Netanya. Stepfather, my mom had moved to Netanya. I decided, and I don't know where this came from, one too many Shlomo stories or whatever, but I got it to my head and I announced it to my wife, my stepfather, and my son, who was six years old at the time. We're going to walk from here to Kiryat Sans, I'm going to find the Klausenberger Rebbe, and I'm going to ask him to fix my soul. <laughs> it seemed like the greatest idea to me. <laughs> my stepfather looked, he didn't even know what half of those words meant. <laughs> my son was like game for it. My wife was just like, you're not going anywhere. I had like two more glasses of wine, and I grabbed them in costume, and we set off for Kiryat Sans. Now, my Hebrew wasn't so good then, as opposed to now, right? All that. <laughs> but I knew enough Hebrew to find someone who spoke enough English to get turned on by this story. This drunk American guy who's saying, I need to find the Klausenberger Rebbe, and I need him to fix my soul. <clears throat> All of a sudden, by, you know, it took about a half an hour before I had a crowd around me of Hasidim. <laughs> And we're going from place to place to place, and we're knocking on doors. And I could see like they're getting more excited. But I was serious about this. I didn't even you know, know what I was in for. And we're knocking on doors, and all of a sudden we knock on doors, a door. And the door opens. And I see the Hasidim like, going like this. And out of this room, glowing like the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur, walks the Klossenberger Rabbi. Or at least someone who said he was a Klausenberger <laughs> Right? It was uh, uh, really, it really, it really was. And he's looking at me, and I just burst into tears. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I need you to fix my soul. And he's like looking around like, what is this guy talking about? And then finally he says to me, what do you want? And I said, Rebbe, I want to feel Purim on Purim. And he was like, what does that mean? <laughs> I'm like, I stumped the Klossenberger. And he says, I bless you, you should have Pirim on Pirim. I'm like, that's great, I'm not sure what Pirim is, but, uh, <laughs> but he called one of his attendants over and he says, you'll come to my tish as my guest. And they, were, they looked impressed and they brought my stepfather who's horrified at this time, like this is not like anything else, he's, he's so freaked out by the Hasidim, my son is having the best time ever, <laughs> I'm trashed. The Hasidim walk us into this giant like gymnasium with these, with, the, with the, the bleachers set up and all the Hasidim and they sit us down right up in front. And the Hasidim are singing and the Klausenberger and Nagunim are like different than others. And like they're soulful and soft and they're singing. And maybe I'm sobering up a little bit, maybe I'm not, but all of a sudden the Klausenberger walks in and the whole room goes nuts with this music. And he walks over and they bring to him this plate of stuffed cabbage. <laughs> Boy, like he makes this like most incredible brook I've ever seen. And then with his hand, picks up a piece, <laughs> eats a piece, and then with his hand gives it to his shamish sitting next to him, who puts it in the hand of another person, who puts it in the hand of another chassid, who puts it in another hand of another chassid, who puts it in the hand of my stepfather. 
because he's like pointing over to my stepfather and all the Hasidim are looking at this guy who's gone white and he's like saying, I'm not going to eat it. <laughs> I was like, you have to eat it. <laughs> and he ate a piece. I mentioned I got my cabbage next and my son got his piece of stuffed cabbage, hand to hand to hand to hand to hand. <laughs> and I don't know what it was about that. I don't know if there was something in that stuffed cabbage, but, but my stepfather, he was out of there like a shot. I took my son back. He's like, I got to get him home. And I went up just in the bleachers with the chassidim. And I just let the nagunim wash over me. And I started thinking about simcha. And it was the first time I felt that there was something, a lightness that came about. And when it was over, it was dark outside. And I walked out down to the beach on the Tanya by myself at night and just sat and looked out at the ocean. And I realized why Purim is the deepest thing in the world. Because Simcha is the most important thing in the world. And I totally missed what it means. I come from America, from Western society, where Simcha means a smile. Simcha means happy, but it doesn't mean that. What's the, what's the flip side of that? Make, but it, Make your simcha smaller. But what does that tell you? The state of a Jew is simcha. And maybe I realized that what's true simcha is, isn't just being a smile, but it's being really in touch and feeling what's really happening around you. That you could be besimcha over your mom's grave in Adar. And, you know, in Av, when we're crying for the temple, you think about where do those tears come from? When you're at your saddest moment, what do you do? You cry. When you're at your happiest moment, what do you do? You cry. Those tears are coming from the same place, the deepest place within us. That's why Yom Kippur is so high, if you could cry. That's why Purim is so high. That's why when they say the last two holidays that are going to be left are what? Purim and Tisha B'Av. Because the only thing you really cry over are those things that connect you to that deepest part. Mm. Thanks, guys. Thank you.